This episode could be triggering for sensitive listeners and contains mature content. It may not be suitable to all listeners. Should you need any emotional assistance, please see the show notes for telephone numbers that you can call. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are my own and do not reflect the official policy or position of the podcast. Any content provided by contributors such as the host, guests, bloggers, sponsors or authors are of their opinion and are not intended to malign any religion, group, club, organization, company, individual or anyone or anything. Cries were emanating from the baby's crib, but none of those gathered around it moved to comfort. They had eyes only for the single man among them. With reverence, they stared at him, eyes shining, not with happiness, but with awe. They trembled in his presence, bodies alert, ready to serve him better. Not a word crossed their lips. They waited instead for him to speak. Still the child cried, disrespectful. Irritated, the man seized the cot and shook it roughly. Silence fell. He opened his mouth to fill the void. The child, he began in his commanding voice, looking down into the cot, seeing far into the future, will be my worst enemy. The prologue from The Girl in the Shadows, My Life in a Cult, by Katie Morgan Davies. This is Decoding Cults, and I'm your host, Palsy. You are listening to the Workers' Institute, Part 3. In today's episode, we are going to look at the rest of the story into the cult and the ultimate end. If you haven't listened to the first two parts, I'd urge you to stop here and go and listen. That way, this part of the story will make more sense. In our last episode, we covered some of the Workers' Institute's beliefs, the birth and the first few years of Katie's life, and the escape of Leanne in 1989. As I mentioned, Katie was devastated when Leanne left the group. Even though she was not allowed any affection by any of the members, she was not treated all that badly by Leanne, and she felt a bit of an affinity towards her. I just want to add in here that it may have been easier for the British citizens in the group to escape as Bala kept the passports for all of the other members. So the followers who were from other countries were maybe not able to leave quite as easily. Aisha also treated Katie with some kindness, but that had come to an end when Katie had wet her bed one evening. Aisha was blamed for this and was forbidden any contact with Katie. I wonder how hard this must have been since they were in that small house with all of those people 24 hours a day. Katie's life was rigidly monitored but excruciatingly boring to her. Her schedule consisted of morning lectures, singing, writing, lunch, afternoon nap, a bath, study time. Uh, Then she had to summarize what she had done that day and debate with Sean if she was a good soldier that day for AB. Then there'd be dinner, evening lectures, and finally sleep. This, on top of being stuck inside the house all day, could not have been good for this poor young girl. Bala, of course, would leave the house every so often on some excursion, and then bring back trinkets like train tickets or museum tickets, which Katie needed to stick in her book. This made my heart go out to that little girl. I mean stuck between those walls, not being allowed to go out, and then having to keep record of Bala's outings. On very rare occasions, when Shonda's family came over to visit, Katie would be allowed to leave the house. She was told not to look at anyone or speak to anyone, especially the police. Once outside, she was to walk directly behind Bala, keeping her eyes fixed to his back, 
and would be surrounded by the rest of the followers. Even though these outings were wonderful to little Katie, she also found all of the new sounds of the outside world very intimidating, almost like an assault on her ears. As I mentioned in an earlier episode, Katie had to write down basically everything, and at times, she would let her imagination take over and would write almost like fantasy-type stories about the outside world. Barla would of course get furious at her and tell her that she was not allowed to practice ISA, which stood for Imagining, Speculating and Assuming. This immediately struck me as a thought-stopping technique, often used by cult leaders to ensure that followers only focus on their indoctrination. It also made me sad for that little girl whose entire existence was limited to the house that they were in. I had, and still have, such a massive imagination, I'd be devastated if someone told me that it was basically evil. In December of 1989, Bala suddenly announced that Chairman Mao was bad. This was a massive turn in the group's current belief systems. If you recall from the first part, they had been formed on Maoist beliefs. It was even in their name, the Workers' Institute of Marxism-Leninism Mao Zedong Thought. Well, Bala proclaimed that Mao had gotten too big for his boots, and from that point forward, instead of praising Mao in their daily lectures, he would now have to be berated. I could not find any concrete reason why he changed his mind about his hero so suddenly, but, and this is only my opinion, I think that he may have wanted to ensure that the followers only see him as the godlike figure, and if they praised Mao, well, then Bala would not be the be-all and end-all of their existence. He additionally made Katie change her surname from Mao Penduzi to just plain Ma Penduzi. Before we carry on with the story, I just want to jump back a little bit. After Leanne had escaped the group and sent them their last rental payment, Bala had announced that they were going to go on what he called a rent strike. He told the group that this was to stand against the British fascist state, but and again, this is just my opinion, I think it was because they just couldn't afford to pay rent anymore. On the 2nd of May, 1990, there was a loud banging on the front door. It was the landlord, and the group was unceremoniously kicked out of the house after not having paid rent for almost a year. Obviously, the neighbours came out to see what the commotion was about, and Katie noticed the look of complete shock on their faces when a small girl and all of these women came out of the house with this one man. It seemed like they hadn't realized just how many people were living there at the time, especially the little girl and the lady in the wheelchair. The group then moved to a modest two-story home in Streatham and immediately covered all of the windows. The house was in a terrible state, damp and dank and with very iffy electricity. Bala would start a daily newspaper, which Sean and Katie would help him put together. He called this paper The New World. It was basically cutouts of certain articles from regular newspapers, which Bala would have them stick on an A3 piece of paper and then distribute around the house for the members to read. In 1992, Katie noticed that Cindy had become more and more withdrawn from the group. Because of this, Bala would single her out more than the others to be ridiculed. On the 13th of October 1992, Cindy left for work one morning, but didn't return home that evening. Obviously, Bala claimed that he had wiped her out. A short while after Cindy had escaped the group, Bala had gotten a severe toothache, And instead of having it treated, because, you know, medicine is evil, he just blamed it on his followers, stating that they were the cause of his pain because of their disobedience. That December, something would happen that would plant a seed of defiance in Katie's mind. After being beaten for some perceived action against Bala, she went into a room and thought the most defiant thought she could muster. Now, Remember that she had been taught from birth 
that Bala could hear your every thought and that he would punish you if you heard anything unclean in your head. Well, as young Katie thought this defiant thought, she waited for something terrible to happen to her. But nothing did. And finally, she started to ask herself if this man truly was this all-knowing, all-powerful being. Towards the end of 1993, they were once again evicted from their home in Streatham because they had not paid any rent. This time, they moved into a small three-bedroom apartment. Bala took the main bedroom for himself. Shonda and Shoba shared one of the rooms, and the rest of the followers, including 10-year-old Katie, shared the last bedroom. As the group was now in much more close quarters to Shonda, some of the rituals, like the songs of praise sung to Bala, were paired back, and Katie also left the house once a month with some of the followers, so that the housing authorities did not know that there were more than four people living at the house. Over the years, Bala had come up with some or other invisible mind control machine which would help him keep track of the followers' thoughts, and it would help him eradicate the BFS. In the British spring of 1994, which is around April-May, he introduced his followers to Jackie. Jackie was not a person, but an invisible, omnipresent, mind control satellite type machine that was everywhere and in everything, no matter how big or small the item was. Jackie stood for Jehovah, Allah, Christ, Krishna, and immortal Ishwaran. So basically, a satellite type machine made up of the deities from different faiths and a guru. Apparently, Ishwaran was a spiritual leader from India. Jackie had become the threat that Bala would use, stating that it could wipe any of the followers out in the blink of an eye should they ever disobey him in any way. Katie notes in her book how incredibly scary this was and how she would even hear Aisha scream at night since the arrival of Jackie. The followers would also become more alert and would snitch on each other even more. Now, remember up to this point, Katie still had no idea who her real parents were. At first, she was told that she had simply jumped into Bala's hand. Then, she was told that she had come from a test tube, and later that she was the creation of Jackie. But in 1995, when it looked likely that the group was going to have to move again, Bala had convinced Sean to contact her mother in Wales, to see if there would be a possibility that some of them could live there as a last resort. It was then that Bala produced a birth certificate. In this birth certificate, Katie saw that her mother was listed as Sean, and that the surname listed was Davies, the same as Sean's. Katie was told by Bala that this was just a lie that they had made up for the outside world. She obviously believed him, but would at times fantasize about having a real mother or even a grandmother that would actually care for her. On the 7th of May, 1996, they finally found an appropriate three-storied home in Brixton, so they all packed up and moved there, and Sean cut off all communications with her mother once more. The bottom floor of the house consisted of two living rooms, and it is in one of these where Sean and Josie slept. The middle floor consisted of the kitchen and the main bedroom where Bala and Shonda slept. Up a narrow staircase, there were two more bedrooms and a bathroom. One of these bedrooms was shared by Shoba and O, and the other by Katie and Aisha. Both the bedrooms shared by Katie and Aisha and the bathroom windows faced the backyard. Remember this layout as it will become important later in the story. A few months later, the Summer Olympics were held in Atlanta in the US. This revealed another flaw of Bala to Katie. You see, up to that point, Bala had proclaimed that the Olympic Games would not take place in 1996 because by that year, he would have taken over the world. But as it was happening right in front of her eyes and Bala merely stopped talking about the timeline, Katie added this to the list of things that she was starting to believe as untrue. On the 13th of November 1996, Bala's mom passed away. 
Bala was quite close with his mom, and he lashed out at his followers, especially Sean, for her passing. He said that when his parents had come to visit back in 1979, and they had met Sean, his mother had told Bala that she liked her because they were very alike. So, Bala took this and ran with it, obviously. He blasted Sean, stating that Jackie had killed his mother because they had been so similar, so Sean needed to start pulling her socks up. This must have taken an immense toll on Sean because she basically stopped eating and would behave erratically from that point on. I think that things had gotten too much for even Sean to handle. On the 19th of December, Sean ordered Katie to write, It is thanks to Comrade Sean that you are alive. And also, Comrade Sean, my darling mother. This confused the hell out of Katie. But then, in the same breath, she made Katie write that Sean was a bloody prostitute and was not her mother, but Bala and Shonda were her parents, and to cross out the first two sentences. The frantic and shrill way in which Sean was talking scared the then almost 10-year-old Katie. I am going to insert a trigger warning here, as I will be discussing suicidal ideation. So, if this is in any way triggering to you, please skip over the next minute or so. I just want to add here that if you ever have these feelings, please reach out to someone. There are many resources out there that can assist you. You never have to feel alone. Late at night on the 21st of December, Katie had awoken to horrific screams that seemed to be from Sean. She wanted to go down to see what was going on, but Aisha made her stay in the room, which was a good thing. Sean had stabbed herself with a knife. Josie was there and managed to eventually stop her from continuing to hurt herself. Then, on the night of the 23rd, they were once again woken up, but this time from shouting. Sean was having a full-on verbal fight with Shonda and Bala. This was unheard of in the collective. As Katie, Aisha and O made their way down the stairs, they heard shouting the one second, and then deathly silence the next. When they entered the room, they found Sean on the floor, and Bala gave the order for them to pin her down, just like he had done a few years before with Leanne. The followers immediately obeyed, and Bala told them that she had tried to escape, but he had saved her. When they finally managed to calm her down, Sean asked Bala if she could call her mother. Bala refused. Over the next few days, Sean would swing between utter silence or crazy outbursts. She had even at one point shouted at Bala saying, If you are immortal, then why are you aging? Then around 6pm on the 24th of December, they heard another scream. This time, it was not Sean, but Aisha. She had entered the bathroom just as Sean was jumping out of the window. Now, I'm just going to add here that there has been speculation that she had been pushed and that Aisha was just a cover story. But in her mental state at that point, to me anything could be possible. The collective found her on the patio floor in the backyard in a pool of thick black blood and an ambulance was called. The group never let Sean's mother know what had happened and when she would try and call the house, They'd lie and say that she was on a trip to India, when all the while she was lying paralyzed in a hospital. They even listed Josie as the next of kin. Katie felt mixed emotions over this tragedy. On the one hand, her tormentor was now out of the house, and she had a lot more freedom, which included more free time to herself, where she would be able to sneak into Bala's office and read any book that she could get her hands on. On the other hand, she still suspected that Sean really was her mother, but kind of hoping that she wasn't. Katie would accompany Bala to the hospital once a week to go and visit Sean. One day in April, she mustered up the courage as she left and whispered to Sean, Bye bye, mummy, to which Sean replied, Bye bye, baby. Katie writes in a book that in that moment, she thinks she actually saw what looked like love coming from Sean's expression on her face. 
This was something she had never seen from her before. A few days later, Sean started suffering from epileptic fits. Katie was not allowed to go visit her again. Then, tragically, on the 3rd of August 1997, Sean Davies passed away. Her mother did find out later, and an investigation was launched into her death, but it was eventually ruled an accident. After Sean's death, Bala was terribly angry and warned the followers that Jackie had killed Sean, and if they did not obey his every command, they would all be killed as well. He even went as far as claiming that the tragic death of Princess Diana was orchestrated by Jackie because Katie had dared to call Sean mom. Yes, that whisper didn't slip his ears. Katie was devastated, thinking that that accident had been all her fault. When the Twin Towers fell in New York in September of 2001, Bella would talk animatedly about how they deserved it. He also still continued to beat his followers. Shonda would take over Katie's primary education, and at some point, she even let Katie start calling her mom, and she would eventually start calling Bala dad. By this time, she had kind of figured out that he might be her dad. Towards the end of 2002, Bala insisted that all of the remaining followers watch the 6pm news with him. Thereafter, he would go into long lectures about how bad the fascist state was, and then, in early 2003, when talks start over invading Iraq, Bala was once again livid with the BFS, because, as you may have guessed, Saddam Hussein was one of his latest heroes. They moved house again, this time to a tiny two-bedroom ground floor apartment. And, just a reminder, There were still seven people in this group, including Bala. O started to feel quite ill. She would constantly complain about neck pain and started vomiting a lot. Instead of allowing her medical treatment, Bala would insist that she only concentrate on him. Now remember, O was a nurse. On the evening of 11 May 2004, O and Josie were busy cleaning up in the kitchen. Josie had opened a cupboard door to put some cups away and O bent down to pick something up. As she stood, she banged her head hard against the cupboard. She immediately started vomiting and yelled out for someone to call a doctor and then passed out. Now, seeing that she was a nurse, you would think that they would listen and call a doctor immediately. But no. Bala and Shonda merely stood there debating whether she was really hurt or if she was just rebelling against Bala because she had not spoken when he asked her a question. I mean the ego on this guy. She was passed out. They only called an ambulance after an hour. O had suffered from a stroke and would sadly succumb to her wounds the next day. Katie would be told that she was murdered by the fascist state. Now, You would be forgiven in still thinking of Katie as a little girl at this point, because at times I still do, but Katie is 21 years old here, an adult, and she's still being treated like a child. She'd still never really interacted with the outside world. Remember that the followers had been with Bala since the 70s, when they were in their 20s, so they would be in their late 40s, early 50s by now. That's almost 30 years of coercive control and indoctrination, not to mention physical and sexual abuse that they have endured. The police came to investigate, but once again the group lied about their various whereabouts, and the case was deemed an accident. By 2005, Katie had had enough. She, very cautiously, started formulating a plan to escape. She slowly started packing some clothing and snuck any change that she could find, although she had no real idea how money worked, as she'd never been taught or allowed to handle money for that matter. How scary that a 22-year-old woman had never learned this basic skill. I mean, we all know about money from a very young age, but I digress. Katie had originally planned her escape for the 18th of April that year. 
But the day before she was to leave, she was summoned by Bala. Apparently, Josie, with her eagle eyes, had noticed that Katie was packing things and had looked in her bag. She'd reported to Bala what she had seen, and Bala now confronted Katie with the information. When he asked her if she was making any plans to leave, she immediately denied it. He seemed to believe her, but did warn her that if she ever were to leave, she would either be struck down by lightning or would spontaneously combust. Even though Katie was still a bit scared of the powers of Jackie, she was still determined to leave and move the date by two weeks when she would have a gap to do it again. Then, finally on the 2nd of May 2005, she escaped. The thing is, Katie had never gone anywhere by herself and she was completely unprepared for the outside world. Not knowing what to do next, she told a few people that she came across that she had run away from home and didn't know what to do. No one really cared until one man kindly told her to go to the police station. When she finally made her way there, this poor woman told the desk clerk that she had run away. When the clerk asked why, she did not have the words to describe what had happened to her. She just said it was because her dad didn't let her go out. The sad thing is, the clerk, not knowing of the extent of Katie's situation, merely told her to call her dad and let him know where she was, which they did. Once Katie got home, Shonda gave her a hug for the first time and Bella sat her down and had a kind-ish chat with her. Katie felt as if she might be okay, but the next morning, Bala hissed at her that she was a traitor and smacked her in the face. The group moved again the next year, this time to Brixton, and Katie did not attempt another escape. Things didn't get any better. Even though Bala was getting on in years, he still beat the woman quite severely. By the end of 2012, Katie started to become severely ill and lost a lot of weight, so much so that even Josie became worried. They knew that Bella would refuse any medical treatment, so Josie and Katie started working on an escape plan, which took a lot of persuading from Katie's side. Josie even managed to slyly purchase a mobile phone. They were just unsure as to how exactly they would leave. Then, One evening, they saw a telephone number for a helpline on a television ad, and they memorized it. At the first opportunity, Josie called the number and was eventually put in contact with the Freedom Charity. Over the course of a few days, they secretly contacted the charity and planned their escape. It was planned down to the minute to ensure that they could not be stopped by Bala. Then... At 11.15am on 25 October 2013, Josie and Katie walked out of the front door. They had packed their mega possessions into a trolley and walked to the rescuers. Yvonne and her husband Gerard were part of the group who rescued the woman. They noted that even though Katie was 30 at the time, she only had the skills of about an 11-year-old. Katie was taken to a doctor and she was diagnosed with diabetes. It was so bad, if they had waited a few more days, she might have slipped into a coma and could possibly have died. So it was a real miracle that they had left when they had. When Bala got home, he was incredibly angry and then the police came knocking. They offered Aisha protection and said that she could be reunited with Katie and Josie, which she agreed to. The three women were taken to a shelter in Leeds, and an official investigation ensued. Then, on the 21st of November 2013, Bala and Shonda were arrested. Shonda would eventually be released, and it was said that she didn't have any involvement. After reading Katie's book, however, I don't think she was as innocent as she proclaimed, but I don't think maybe there was enough physical evidence against her, but this is just my opinion. Josie did an about turn and once again became a fierce supporter of Bala, claiming to all who would listen that he was innocent. 
I'm pretty sure that she probably formed a trauma bond and it was really hard for her to let go of Bala and that life that she knew. In November of 2015, the trial began. At Bala's trial, Cindy and Leanne got onto the stand and gave accounts of the torture and assault, both physical and sexual, that had been inflicted on them over the years that they had been part of the group. Katie also gave evidence of everything that had happened to her. And remember those books that she had to write? Well, those were used as evidence too. She was born into the cult and she was stuck there for over 30 years. On the 4th of December 2015, Aravindan Balakrishnan, aged 75, was found guilty of his daughter's false imprisonment, child cruelty and the rape, sexual assault and assault of two other female followers. On Friday the 29th of January 2016, he was sentenced to 23 years in prison and I am glad to let you know that Katie was given the option to change her name. Thus, she chose Catherine Roseanne Francesca Morgan Davies. Katie, after Katy Perry, her song Raw had inspired Katie, and she also chose the surname to honour her maternal family. It took a lot of time for her to learn even the basic life and social skills, which many of us take for granted. She now lives independently in Leeds and is even studying towards a degree. Heck, she may even have it by this time. She also wrote the book, which I used as one of my references. If you want to learn more about this incredible woman's life, it is called The Girl in the Shadows, My Life in a Cult. Aisha was placed in a home for abused women where she is living out the rest of her days quietly. I hope that Cindy and Leanne found some semblance of peace and that they are happy. Josie, who was so incredibly indoctrinated that she turned back to her tormentor, well, she moved back in with Shonda and they both continued to proclaim Bala's innocence. I think having been with him for almost 40 years, it must have been hard to unlearn so many things. I've also read that sometimes the shock of leaving a cult is almost worse for a person's mental health than being in it, especially if they're not ready to leave. Bala died in prison on the 9th of April 2022 at the age of 81. If you enjoyed this episode, please hit the subscribe button and rate and review us. It will go a long way into improving the podcast and helping others find it. Please invite family and friends to listen as well. If you are listening on YouTube, please subscribe and like the video. You can also leave comments if you want. You can find us on Facebook and you can email us at decodingcults at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. If there are any topics around the workings of cults which you would like further explanation on, or if there is a cult that you would like to hear about, email me or post it in the Facebook group. Remember to go and check out By Design Crafts SA and Endeavor AV and tell them that we sent you. The amazing logo art was created by the tattoo artist Jock Jacobs. Thank you so much for listening.